Hey everyone, John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze and author of 110 Things to See with a Telescope and the new book, Learn to Stargaze for Kids. So last month, Celestron sent me several telescopes, including the Celestron Nexstar 130 SLT. Now I've been getting a lot of questions about this telescope as well as the StarSense version, the 130DX. But wait, you don't own the 130DX. I don't? You don't. Huh. Hold for a second. We do now. This is Learn to Stargaze. I see a lot of people talking about these 5-inch Newtonian telescopes, so I thought I'd post this video to help. Note that the 130 in the name of these telescopes refers to the aperture in millimeters. In this case, the aperture is simply the diameter of the big mirror inside the telescope. And as Mrs. Stargaze pointed out, I don't actually have the official StarSense version of the scope, even if it has the same optical tube in gray instead of brown. But I have used the StarSense 130DX before. Haven't I? All right, so I've got a Celestron StarSense DX. Now this is owned by astronaut Cyan Proctor, and so she just got it as a gift from Cel Celestron, and the mirror wasn't even attached to this mirror assembly. And as you can see, it's completely lopsided. We've got Sam Proctor's uh, telescope here, and we got it working again. Check it out. Amazing. As you saw in that clip from last year, telescopes like this can be a bit temperamental. Newtonians have a lot of parts, so there's simply more that can go wrong compared to a refractor. That said, there are clear advantages to these mid-sized Newtonian reflector telescopes. They provide crisp images of the moon and planets, and you don't have nearly as much chromatic aberration on bright objects, if any at all. You also tend to get more aperture per dollar with Newtonians. Increase the aperture by 40% and you double the amount of light the telescope collects. So objects just tend to look better, stars appear brighter, and you'll see more stars and more deep sky objects will be in range of the telescope. The other advantage with larger apertures is higher resolution on the objects you're viewing. This is especially noticeable on the moon and planets. Okay, we talked a bit about the telescope, now let's talk about these mounts, which if you're shopping for one of these telescopes will help you decide which one is for you. First, the Nexstar mount. This is a motorized go-to mount, which serves two purposes. First, to slew directly to targets in the sky, and second, to track those objects as they move across the sky. Telescopes on these mounts are really nice for observing with groups of people, so you don't need to be constantly adjusting the telescope between each person. It's also nice to have the telescope go to the targets for you. Most people just use the hand controller, but with extra adapters, it can be plugged into a computer or guide it with your phone. For example, All Star Telescope recently sent me the Celestron Sky Portal Wi-Fi adapter, which allows you to control this telescope from your phone. After going through the alignment process, you simply point the phone at your sky, select an object from the star map, and the telescope will slew directly to that target. In any case, the challenge with the go-to system is that the alignment process can be time-consuming and finicky. Sometimes the alignment process fails altogether, and sometimes the telescope gets bumped or moved, and you have to start the alignment process over again. The StarSense Explorer system is completely different. StarSense uses your phone's camera to orient the telescope to the sky, and then you manually push the telescope to each target. You use these slow motion controls to manually track the objects as they move across the sky. The advantage to this system is that it's pretty much effortless to set up. Just open the app and attach the phone to the StarSense dock. Even if you move your telescope around to different parts of the yard, the app automatically aligns itself and therefore the telescope to the sky. The downside to the StarSense system is that it's still a manual process. And if your budget is limited, your money might be better spent on a larger telescope, one where you find the objects using your finder without electronic assistance. That's why every page in the book 110 Things to See with a Telescope includes a custom star map for every target, with a bullseye to help you align your finder to the precise location. Once you've found each target, be sure to record your observation in the space provided. If you're using this book to earn a Messier certificate, check with your local astronomy club. They may want you to turn off your telescope's electronic assistance in order to give you credit for the observation. With all Newtonian telescopes, you need to check the collimation of the telescope before you get started. This is primarily to check that there's no issues with the mirrors and that the mirrors are precisely aligned. 
The simplest way to do this is with an eyepiece cover with a hole in the middle. Place the eyepiece cover in the hole for the eyepiece. When you look in, first check that the reflection of the primary mirror is centered in the secondary mirror. Use the mirror clips on the primary mirror as a guide. This should be spaced evenly around the field of view. Second, you want to make sure that the spider arms in the image are of equal length. If one or both of these is a miss, the telescope will definitely need to be collimated. I like to use a laser collimator and these can be purchased for about $30. To collimate the telescope, turn on the laser and put it in the eyepiece holder. Adjust these three screws here with an Allen wrench until the laser beam is centered in the primary mirror. Then center the beam in the target on the collimator itself. Moving to the back of the telescope, loosen these three mirror locks and make the required adjustments with these three knobs. When the beam is centered, retighten the mirror locks and the telescope is collimated. These telescopes are designed for visual astronomy only. Neither the Nexstar nor the StarSense versions of this telescope are designed for astrophotography. But that doesn't stop us from trying. But be warned, astrophotography is incredibly frustrating and remarkably addictive at the same time. And if you catch the bug, it can also become incredibly expensive. Now the Nexstar mount is not really capable of handling much weight, so I wouldn't attempt to attach a DSLR but an iPhone or small astronomy camera should be fine. If you watched our last video, we took a photo of Jupiter with the StarSense mount. And if you recall, the planet remained in the field of view for no more than a few seconds. You won't have that problem with the next star mount because of the tracking. That does not mean you can safely take long exposures. Even though this telescope is tracking, the image will rotate within the frame. This is called field rotation. Now, whether I'm using the Nexstar or the StarSense, I like to use the NexYZ adapter and a phone for images of the moon. For the planets, a designated planetary camera can be a lot of fun. I like to use an ASI Air, which makes the processing much more efficient. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the Next Star Telescope and how it compares to the StarSense version of the same scope. Please subscribe to Learn to Stargaze so you don't miss the next video. Check out LearnToStargaze.com for cool stargazing merch. And remember, the future is looking up. <laughs>